Aside from Keanu Reeves never missing a single target, you get knife fights, sword play, axe throwing, museum spades, bows and arrows, and even a Bruce Lee nunchaku double stick that will give you pretty much an overdose of everything you want in an action movie, but all turned up to the max. From the end of chapter 3, where Ian McShane's Winston has shot John Wick off the roof of a building, and because he survived that fall, he will definitely have no trouble, even when he runs through a glass window of a building and lands hard on the ground. There's one scene in the third act, which I think is almost slapstick, where assassins kick John Wick down the Rue Marie's Utrillo staircase in France, and having rolled all the way down the 100 steps, he doesn't bleed, he has no back problems, no broken neck or nerve damages, but stands up and takes down every single guy. And this even... This isn't even the peak of its insanity as we have a blind high table assassin this time around who has really good aim and he is brought to the flesh by Hong Kong's Donnie Yen, which is where I'm from, and I think he truly is the MVP of the film and a really great asset, not just in terms of the action sequences he brings, but also for the narrative, particularly with the complicated friendship and history he shares with John Wick. He also has someone he cares for about and is perhaps in a similar boat as John Wick, who hopefully wants to put his assassin life behind him, with the difference being he still has to work for the high table. I love how he's introduced in the first set piece of the film. He sits in the shadows of this kitchen in this Japanese continental hotel. While everyone's fighting, he's slowly just finishing his noodles while everyone else is battling each other. And then he lifts his cane, stands up, and catches an arrow. And I love the attention to detail of how he briskly sets up motion sensors around the area to hear who's coming after him. The film really understands how to take full advantage of Donnie Yen's martial arts capabilities. Even though this is the second time he's played someone blind after Rogue One, it's a really innovative way to design fight sequences, and I was worried that he wouldn't have a lot of screen time, so it was pleasing that his character was properly utilized, and in fact he probably has the same amount of screen time as Bill Skarsgård, who's appropriately menacing as he plays this elegant marquee surrounded by these Victorian mansions and bird the environments. When he exercises his power to strip Ian McShane's Winston from being the Continental Manager, it creates a refreshingly new dynamic between Winston and John throughout the film. Because of its nearly three hour runtime, the film doesn't get into the action sequences straight away, so there's actually long sections of just expanding the tension among the high table around the world. I think the pacing mostly works quite well despite its length and you don't usually expect to see elegant sweeping shots through these beautifully constructed interiors in an action movie. There's a long tracking shot of Ian McShane just walking towards Bill Skarsgård in an art gallery which is almost more reminiscent of a Stanley Kubrick movie as well as the opening in a Morocco desert which feels like the film is aspiring to be Lawrence of Arabia. Visually it is very sumptuous because it's once again shot by Dan Lauston, a frequent collaborator of Guillermo del Toro's. His use of orange lighting, shadow lighting, or low light through church windows, which is impeccable and features some really, really eye-popping night cinematography. This really plays a big part in the action sequences as well, whether it's making use of indoor waterfalls for a nightclub fight between Keanu Reeves and Scott Atkins. You can see the clarity of each little particle and also the shootout with guns and bows and arrows in the Japanese Continental Hotel under neon green lighting and even in small scenes when Lawrence Fishburne gives John his tailored suit in a train station which feels like an outtake from the Matrix that's too good to be true. I really think introducing audiences to the Osaka Continental is a great addition. The exceptional extended supporting cast is really another reason why this film is worth the price of admission. The legendary Hiroyuki Sanada excels as the manager of this venue and he has some great action sequences to participate in. The highlight is Rina Saiwayama as his daughter and in her debut film role, she's excellent in both her emotional versatility and also really shines in the action sequences. Shamir Addison as this Mr. Nobody also has a level of a complexity I didn't expect as his loyalty to Skarsgård's Marquis is constantly shifting. One minute he wants a higher price for John Wick's bounty, but sometimes he 
helps John Wick out of certain situations. And there's a really nice callback to the first film because it involves a dog. And finally, of course, it was, this will sadly be the penultimate time we see Lance Reddick as the concierge. I think he filmed his scenes for Ballerina, the Ana de Armas-led John Wick spin-off. I think his passing really will be missed. And I should say his character's fate in this movie really does hit differently after the recent tragedy. What makes this film so effective is not necessarily because it's bigger and it's got more action, but how innovatively the action set pieces are filmed. The stunts feel physical and tactile when you see Keanu Reeves rolling down a staircase and driving through reverse traffic in Paris, which then culminates to an incredible shootout in the middle of moving cars. There's a long take of a minority report-esque overhead shot, which follows Keanu Reeves' GTA gunning down every assassin across rooms and hallways. The film really outdoes the previous films in terms of feeling the sense of scale across all these globetrotting locations. So much so that these 30 minute long action sequences never feel like it's too much. Like when Donnie Yen and Keanu Reeves evoke John Woo's face off when they're repeatedly shooting each other through glass mirrors. Who would have thought that a mid-budget film about a guy killing 80-something people for someone stealing his car and killing his dog actually would spot a successful franchise? The film actually takes the narrative of the first film seriously and uses it to ask questions like when will John Wick actually find peace or whether he will truly earn his freedom. That will really depend on whether you pay attention to the plot of these movies. But the final moments in the film really gives a new light to John Wick's character in terms of the ultimate choice John Wick makes and how the film concludes certain narrative arcs and I actually left the theater quite haunted. Aside from the spin-offs and TV shows, if director Chad Stahelski do decide to end it on this one, I think he and his team have left it on a really high note. It truly is the best film of the John Wick franchise, and it definitely is one of the best action films I've seen in the cinemas. So thanks for watching this video once again, and please give a like and subscribe so you can stay tuned to our latest videos.